afternoon, everyone. Welcome back from that very long launch. Uh, we're wrapping up today's activity with two presentations. But before I go into that, let me quickly do a little commercial. Managing risks in the maritime industry through the application of engineering solutions. This year event is been sponsored by Seaboard Marine. Seaboard Marine is a premier ocean transportation company providing direct regular service between North America, the Caribbean Basin, Central and South America. They are the one that provided lunch for you and for us to be able to keep you here for the two days. Tourism Enhancement Fund. Uh, the role of Tourism Enhancement Fund is to lead tourism innovation in the areas of transformational infrastructural and sustainable projects, human capital development, and tourism linkages. Tourism Enhancement Fund provided your coffee break for the two days. Uh, talking about approximately $1 million uh, provision of uh, coffee breaks. Universal Service Fund is mandated by the government of Jamaica to ensure access to information and communication tools that facilitate development. The beautiful bags that you are hanging around your shoulder is sponsored by Universal Service Fund. And the biggest of our sponsor is the Caribbean Maritime University, redefining maritime excellence through education, research, and innovation. Three faculties, Faculty of Marine and Nautical Studies, Faculty of Shipping and Logistics, Faculty of, Faculty of Engineering and Applied Technology, Center for Security, Counterterrorism, and Nonproliferation, and School of Graduate Studies and Research. Welcome back. I think we're still expecting a few more to join with us uh, this afternoon. Uh, this afternoon, we have a one man panel. And I know it's going to be very exciting, eh? Galeon Williams. Lectures introductory Spanish at the Caribbean Maritime University and at the West Indies, at the University of West Indies, Mona Campus, our sister institution. He has a Bachelor of Arts degree in biology and Spanish, and a Master of Philosophy in Spanish. She researches teaching foreign languages within the Jamaica context and increasing language awareness. And she's going to be speaking to us on pedagogical implications for the teaching of Spanish to seafaring students at the Caribbean Maritime uh, University. Ladies and gentlemen, please help me welcome Galeon to the podium. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Imagine with me for a second that you have just graduated from the Caribbean Maritime University and you are now a seafarer. And you board a vessel and you notice some suspicious activity happening. But you know your English is masked by the thick Jamaican accent that you have. And so you try desperately to warn the captain of what is afoot, but it didn't work. Ladies and gentlemen, in 1990, something similar happened to a young seafarer on the Scandinavian star. He noticed something that looked like arson was about to take place. He tried to explain, it didn't work. Because as we know, 158 lives were lost after the Scandinavian star was set ablaze. So this is why language for seafaring students is an important topic. So as we talk about language for seafaring students, 
the first thing we need to look at is why language is important. When we talk about risk management, good communication is an important aspect. That's what we've been doing over the last day and a half. We've been talking about risk. We've been talking about how to mitigate against those risks. And James et al. states that for any safety to practice curricula and any good quality assessment curricula, effective communication must be a vital part built into that curricula. Also, we know that for our Jamaican students, some of them matriculate to the tertiary level with a low communicative competence in Jamaican English. All of our courses are taught in Jamaican English, and as such, there'll be problems of comprehension and problems of competency for our students once they matriculate further into their career. So what we need to do is change how things are done in our language classroom. Because it's not only going to affect their ability to communicate, it's going to affect their ability to comprehend what is being taught in the classroom space. So this was an exploratory study. I looked at literature, and we divided the study into three parts based on the findings. So we're going to look at maritime English training, the Jamaican language situation, and constructivism and the communicative language teaching approach. So maritime English training. We all know that the official language of the seafarer, the lingua franca, is maritime English. However, maritime English is often taught as a second or foreign language because when we look at the studies, most of the studies are coming from places like Thailand and China, India and so on, where English is not their predominant language. However, here in the Caribbean, in the English-speaking Caribbean, we assume that because we're already an English-speaking country by virtue of our official language, that we don't need to focus on teaching maritime English in particular as English for special purposes. However, when we look at other careers, such as careers in aviation, careers in medicine, they are taught the language that they need to communicate so they know how to operate within their, their sphere of influence as well as communicate with the layman who they will be interacting. So what are some of the challenges with teaching maritime English? Well, it depends on what language the person is starting from. There could be what we call lingual interference, meaning the language that they speak is interfering with the language that they're now trying to learn. We see that all the time in our classrooms every day as our students sometimes struggle to explain themselves in English and have to resort to Jamaican Creole. When we add a foreign language to the picture, it further compounds what it is that they are struggling with. In addition to that, there are standardization challenges. To what level of competence do we need to bring our marine seafarers? When we have people who come from different backgrounds, different ethnicities, different cultures, how do we standardize a language when we cannot standardize the languages from which they'll be learning that particular language? Although the IMO has given us short phrases and commands and so on, Outside of that, when there needs to be spontaneous communication, for example, something happens on board a vessel and there's more communication needed than just the short commands, sometimes there are challenges with the accents, sometimes there are challenges with how the words are arranged based on their primary language, and we could list other issues. Additionally, the materials used are not standardized. Some of the institutions test for all of the aspects of language learning. Some only test for listening and speaking. Some only test for reading and writing. So there's no real standard. So even though there are definite standards to which a captain must attain, to which the deck officer must attain, there's no standard for the language. We'll move on now to the Jamaican language situation. Well, what is our language situation? The jury is still really out on the definition of what Jamaican language situation is. We know that the official language is English. However, we know that the language that's used every day is what? Patois, a.k.a. Jamaican Creole. Thank you. So what is the relationship between Patois and English? Is Patois even a language? Yes, Patois is a language. It has its own spelling. It has its own grammatical rules. I use it in my class all the time. 
Bilingualism is a situation in which two languages coexist. One is considered a stronger language, in our case that would be Jamaican Creole, and one is considered a weaker language, in our case Jamaican English. A diglossia speaks to a language tied to your socioeconomic status. And so we have a higher, what they call a higher variety, which would be the Jamaican English, and the lower variety would be Jamaican Creole. The Creole continuum speaks to a coexistence of the dialect or the Jamaican Creole along with Jamaican English. And so we have points along that continuum and, the, and it's also tied into your socioeconomic background. And so at the lower end of the socioeconomic scale, we tend to hear most of what we call basilect or raw Jamaican Creole. In the middle class, we have what we call the mesolect or mesolect, and that is a blend of English and Creole. And then at the very top, we have the people who try to speak Creole, but they can't really speak it, right, the acrolects. So we have a challenge now, because in the language classroom, three languages are now in coexistence, especially in the foreign language space. We have the Jamaican Creole, the Jamaican English, and the foreign language, because try as we might, we have to sometimes use the Creole to explain to our students what it is that we need them to learn. But should Creole stay? Should we make Creole our official language? There's a teaching methodology that allows us to incorporate it in a way that doesn't ruffle anybody's feathers, right? So let's look now at constructivism and the communicative language teaching approach. The communicative language teaching approach is a whole tool. It's a philosophy of functional approaches and strategies that we can use in the language classroom. It's often employed for second languages and foreign languages. And I believe, given the uniqueness of our situation, that maritime English, maritime English and Jamaican English should be something that's more intentionally taught in our classrooms and not assumed that because we are an English speaking country that everyone will matriculate with the language. So what are some of the tenets of, of um, CLT? Well, there's the comparison and contrasting of the native language and the target language. There's the inclusion of culture in the classroom space to foster greater understanding. There's the inclusion of interdisciplinary connections that will allow us to make our lessons more authentic, related to what the students are learning otherwise. That brings me to the next C, content that is relevant. And now we're going to also stretch our community beyond the classroom. Vygotskyan constructivism is, the, is the, 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 the philosophy within which we root down our communicative language teaching. And it says that the social interaction that's taking place in the classroom allows us as lecturers, the more knowledgeable other, to take the student from what they know, Jamaican Creole, across what is termed their zone of proximal development to what they don't know or what we want them to know, which would be Spanish and Jamaican English. And why am I emphasizing Spanish or a foreign language when we said that the language that you use on the ship is, this, is, is English? Well, in learning a foreign language, you're going to be forced to reinforce what you know in English and compare and contrast so you're going to get better. In other words, increase your language competence in English. And we want to do that in what we call authentic learning situations, meaning instead of just teaching them random Spanish, maybe as a Spanish lecturer, I need to board a ship. Maybe I need to go down to the port, see what they need to communicate about, and then start incorporating that into my lesson in a way that makes the language learning not only more useful, but more attractive for the students. And in so doing, we will change the way that we do language. So what are my recommendations? We have to change our language curricula. It's just that simple. But how do we do that? Just make any change we feel like? No, these changes need to be bolstered by research. So the first thing we have to do is assess the needs of our seafarers. About what exactly do they need to communicate? Once we've assessed their needs, we also need to assess their competence. We can't take them somewhere if we don't know where they are. Right? So we have to assess their competence, see where they're at now, assess their needs, what is it that they need to be able to speak about, and then we create strategies. Right? We create strategies that will help our students in our context increase their competence. How will we know if it works? We would have done the pre-checks through the competency assessments 
after we've implemented our strategies, then we can test again to see how effective they were. What do we need to tweak? Is it working? Should we just forget this thing altogether? You know, we have to make that, that decision based on the research that we have done. So in conclusion, what have we observed? We know that incompetence in, in, as it relates to communication can cause a lot of issues. A lot of accidents have happened in the past because of that. We also know that once we've increased your language competence, it will also result in a decrease in the risk because we are better able to communicate what the risk is and communicate how we're going to mitigate against that risk. Increasing the competence for the students will also help across every aspect of their language learning because once you have a better awareness of your language, you will be better able to follow the instructions on exams. You'll be better able to understand what it is that your lecturers are saying. So what is it that our seafaring students need? They need to increase their competence in both Jamaican English and Maritime English in a more intentional way. So make it a fixed part of the curricula, in other words. And we do this in authentic language learning curricula, in authentic situations. And I want to end with this quote from Noam Chomsky, a renowned professor of linguistics. You see, on board the ship, they are a family. It's a family from different backgrounds, a multicultural family. And so we can end with this thought that a language is not just words. It is indeed a culture, a tradition, a unification of a community, a whole history that creates what a community is. All of that is embodied in a language. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Ms. Williams. I also want to extend a big thank you to Mina Elise Medina, because when she saw the draft, and didn't see Galen's name on the agenda, she came crying to me. This cannot happen. <laughs> Thank you for that, uh, Mena. Ladies and gentlemen, let us put our hands together for <laughs> Galen. We will entertain uh, two questions. Though she presented uh, in English language, but your question must come in Spanish. Okay, good afternoon again. So, um, Gillian, I want to ask you, um, the language issues in Jamaica are not unique. I am sure that these situations occur in other parts of the world. Have you found another country or another culture where they have addressed this problem, maybe not for seafarers, it may have been um, some other group, by the means or the methods that you're suggesting. Do you have a comparative um, situation that I could relate to? Yes, um, when researching for my, my Masters of Philosophy, we did find that a similar thing happens in Haiti with French Creole. You find that also in Trinidad, they have the same issue where the local dialect tends to bleed into what the standard language is, and it poses a problem in classroom for comprehension, for communication, because we understand that although we embrace our culture and we embrace our languages, that on a global stage, nobody else really will understand, and it will be more of a distraction. So yes, there are other places that would have encouraged the use of mother tongue in the classroom to bridge the gap. No, no, I was actually talking about where you spoke about, okay, you have this unique group called seafarers that have specific needs, language problems, have caused issues, um, you know, risks and so on. Is there a comparative situation to that? Because I'm trying to understand whether this is a unique thing you're proposing or whether you've seen this work in another situation and so you're saying we're gonna, this is something that can be tried. Actually, I've not seen it for a specific group. So in the studies that I would have done, it's mostly that they're just learning English. There are some challenges with learning English. Yes, their native language will bleed over a bit, but nobody has necessarily said, okay, we're going to use our mother tongue to bridge it and then use another foreign language, etc." no. Any other question, colleagues? Well, thank you very much, uh, Galeon. 
for that an insightful presentation. Please your hands once again for Galen. Thank you. Now we're moving into our last segment of this year's conference. Seaboard Marine Tourism Enhancement Fund, Universal Service Fund, Caribbean Maritime University, our sponsors for this year's annual industry conference. So we're moving to our last segment now, which is a poster. Please join me up here. Poster presentation, this section is going to be moderated by Dr. Mark Broomfield. My understanding is that we have about six or seven posters to be presented, but it is going to be presented in a different way this time around. It's going to be presented in the form of a PowerPoint. And I think this will make it more exciting. Kindly invite your... Please come up. So there are going to be two groups. The first group, we have five presenters, and the second group, we have uh, four presenters. And the chair of this uh, session is, as I indicated earlier on, Dr. Mark Broomfield, who is our campus director for the western part of Jamaica our campus at the Sam Sharp Teachers College in Montego Bay. Dr. Broomfield, your turn, sir. Thank you very much, Prof. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. It, it is always a good thing to end a conference with the beginning, because the students represent the future of our nation and our institution. So I want you to applaud them so they feel welcome. And, 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 and those who are a little bit nervous and bubbly um, can be comforted. But I want to thank the conference team for allowing the students the opportunity this evening, this afternoon, to present their idea, to trouble the water a little bit, to disturb the mind and to show you what possibilities exist if opportunities are created and presented. So you'll hear from them, they'll be quick, and if you have your questions, write them down, and at the end, they will answer the questions. If they are unable to answer any question and they look towards me, I will support. All right, um, so our first presenter will tell you, it's always a group, so it's, but only one person is allowed to come to the podium to present. So when you come, just introduce yourself, say the members of your group, and go right into your presentation. Right. All right, good afternoon, everybody. My name is Nico Hall. I am a fourth year engineering student. Uh, we were given the opportunity to do a uh, Finally, well, it would be a, a project for a course called Research Methods. Um, we were given the opportunity to research a real life situation and engineer something that could mitigate this, the problem or be a solution. So uh, we have developed a twist lock system. If anybody who would be a part of shipping and logistics, especially in the form of containerized cargo, would understand what a twist lock is. Um, it's what they use to lock the containers on the vehicle that is transporting it via whether ship, truck, train, or to stack the containers and lock them together as one so that they don't fall off the ship. Uh, we have developed a tool that's called the twist lock, the cube lock, sorry. It is a form of twist lock that incorporates uh, both, like more than one uh, tools in one tool to mitigate the problem that we would have in terms of losing containers overboard when the ships encounter rough seas. All right, so just a little introduction. Uh, over the years, we have noticed it's, it's quite evident that shipping and logistics has grown significantly 
which includes the size of the ships themselves, sorry, which includes the size of the ship themselves increasing, which means that more containers are transported in one voyage than before. What that leads to is the fact that when these containers are stacked on board, uh, when the ship encounters rough seas, sometimes the containers, based on the, the lashing and securing devices that they use to secure the containers to the ship, when these fail, the containers oftentimes fall overboard. Uh, it was noted that about 1,500 containers have been lost at sea over the, between the years of 2008 to 2022. A lot of these containers have not been retrieved. A lot of them have washed up on beaches. And if we know what containers transport, they can transport anything from clothing to toxic chemicals, which can be detrimental to the marine, marine environment. So I'll hand over to my colleague and she will explain the design of our tool. Hello, I am Alexia Lawrence. Now, the Q block is, is, is a design which incorporates the existing twist lock and the horizontal securing of a double stacking cone. This will eliminate the dynamic forces acting on the container during storage. Now, the spring in the actuator is designed to compress under 200 newtons or more. This means a loaded container containing about 30 tons will be enough to compress the actuator, thus locking the, con the corner castings securely and safely. Inversely, once the weight of the container is lifted during offloading, the spring will expand, pushing it back in its original position. Here is a, this, the, our 3D model of the design. And now the limitation, the, con the limitation towards this, the container of the same size would have to be stuck together for it to be ac applicable. So this means containers which are high cubes must be stacked beside another high cube in order for the tool to work. So in layman's term, containers must be grouped by their height. You can applaud them. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Brittany Morris, and I'm here presenting on my research that a few of my colleagues and I did, and it is on reducing micro and nanoplastic particles in our aquatic environment. All right, so. The first thing that I must mention is that we have all heard the issues about plastics in our waterways and the oceans and the seas. But we have never really looked into the fact that plastic does not bio, is not biodegradable. Where does it go? And that's where we get the micro and nanoplastic particles. So the aim was to find a solution to reduce the percentage of nano and microplastics in the larger water bodies, such as our oceans and seas. And the, another aim was to improve the marine and human health by extension. And we also wanted to map and track the state of our seas in terms of the presence of plastic and other particles. So as I mentioned before, we have plastic degradation that takes place. These large macroplastics are what we know as the water bottles and other larger particles. Those are then broken down into what we know as the nanoparticles and the mic microparticles. So the microplastics are what we know as my, um, less than five millimeters and the nanoparticles are between one to 100 nano, nano, nanometers, sorry. So what is important to note is that these particles are toxic to the environment. So research has been done where we saw that 
Plastic was found in breast milk and the urine of babies in the form of, of bisphenol, where it is, it does not come, off, come out of the body, it stays in the body and it can cause toxic, um, present, pos toxic possibilities to the human body. So bisphenol, as I mentioned, is something that is a byproduct of these particles, the nano and the microplastics, that has been absorbed into our ecosystem. So we have, we have fishes that would eat the planktons. So then planktons would then eat these nanoplastics because they're at those small levels. The planktons would eat them and then the planktons are eaten by other marine bodies and then those would absorb it and then at that time, we would absorb those from the fishes. So the solution that we came up with is a robotic spion filtration fish which uses the Spion technology, which was done by a group of researchers in Germany at the Friedrich Alexander University. These Spion particles are super paramagnetic um, iron oxide nanoparticles, which act as a kind of a plastic magnet, which when it, it, um, it is exposed to these nanoparticles, then it would attract these plastics and cause it to be removed from the water. So the first thing that we wanted to look at was how these spion particles can be used in a filtration system. So when they did the research, they figured out that yes, it is possible to use these spion particles as a plastic magnet. However, they did not dive further into using it in the oceans or in larger water bodies as a filtration system. So that's where we came in and we decided to create this robotic spion filtration fish which utilizes the spion in a spion chamber within the fish that causes a centrifugal force to remove the nanoparticles from the water bodies. So how it would work is that it, we use biomimicry where we follow the sucker fish and we get the, how it performs in the ocean. So it would suck in some of the water. Once the water is absorbed into the fish, then we would have what is called an electromagnet that releases the spion into the chamber. Once that spion is released into the chamber, we have what is called, before it is released into the chamber, we have a high level and a low level sensor that t determines when the spion fish would close and, re and stop the water from coming in. Once it gets in, it does the centrifugal force and causes the, the mixing of the spion and the nanoparticles, and that would form an agglomerate. Once that agglomerate is formed, then it is re-magnetized, re and it, once it is re-magnetized, it is attracted to the magnet and pulled out of the water. And once it's pulled out of the water, we know that it is already attracted to the plastic, so we are left with clean water, and this clean water is sent back into the ocean. And this is just the design of the fish. And we have the head, the midsection, and the tail, which has different, part, different parts. And we will be able to track it when it is in the ocean. So we are estimating, we are estimating to reduce about 10% of the nanoparticles in the first year. We want it to be able to mimic the movement of the fish tail. And we want to be able to improve the overall marine health. So based on our study, it can be concluded that the spions can be used within the filtration system to cause a uh, reduce in the number of nano and microplastics in our environment. And a future work that we wanted to focus on for this spion um, robotic fish is to maybe have a campaign where persons are able to interact with the fish and cause them to be more interested in the solution that we're trying to solve. Thank you. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Um, my name is Michael Poyle. This is. Um, I'm I'm sorry. Uh, I'm a bit nervous. I was honestly hoping to actually see like ten persons in the audience. <laughs> Especially after lunch. <laughs> All right. Um, again, my name is Michael Poyle. Um, this research is based on the ammonia, use of ammonia 
um, to create a, a, a solution for fisher folks. All right, so this research was done by myself, Michael Powell, Damian Thomas, Gerald McKay, and Ezra Lee McLennan. Unfortunately, they were unable to attend. Um, penalized <laughs> all right um, so the purpose of this study is to present the use of heat generated from fishing vessel engines to heat ammonia for use in refrigeration on a fishing vessel this would reduce monetary cost as well as the weight and space constraints on a fishing vessel um, as you know ice is is very expensive and also, you know, cause weight on the vessel. Um, introduction. In 1820, Michael Faraday discovered how to use ammonia to create a cooling effect. Now, fisher folks um, who practice deep sea fishing have the need to store and preserve their, their prevent, sorry, their fish from spoiling. Um, they used to use, or probably are still using, um, formaldehyde, right, to preserve their fishes. Um, so what we are proposing now is to is to create something basically to. Uh, sorry. All right, so what we are proposing is to create a system that works based on the engine of the vessel, which generates heat as a generator, and that will use to, um, as, well, primarily, it should be a system that has little electrical or mechanical moving parts. Right? Um, it actually eats the liquid ammonia, um, which, goes through an absorber, right? Um, a separator, which turns um, ammonia into vapor, and then goes through a condenser and to an, another evaporator, which allows for cooling. Now, what you are looking at on the screen is a smaller vessel, right? And in that vessel, we would have to design what we have here to hold in that space comfortably as to not cause any um, loss of um, comfort to the fisher uh, the fishermen um, what we expect to get from this is um, the proposed ammonia refrigeration system for a medium sized fishing vessel most must be dependable, efficient, and capable of maintaining a uniform, a uniform temperature throughout the chilled space. The system should be suitable, suitably designed and configured to, to generate or to guarantee that it can maintain the desired temperature and humidity levels throughout the refrigeration space. I am a bit nervous, I'm sorry. As, <laughs> as safety is paramount, um, the design and operation of any ammonia refrigeration system, the system must also be designed to minimize energy consumption and the risk of ammonia leaks or any other safety hazards. The system should be designed um, primarily as a a 10 cubic feet freezer. Now, we are hoping to get temperatures as low as 18 degrees Celsius, um, which we believe should be suitable for the fishermen to actually preserve their fish at sea coming into shore. 
the uh, this this internet not be working for me. Okay. All right. So the benefits. Ammonia cooling system offers serious benefits such as energy efficiency, low operating cost, low global warming potential. A study by the SEAM 2019 investigated the environmental impact of ammonia cooling system and found that ammonia has a low global warming potential and it can help reduce the carbon footprint of refrigeration and air conditioning system. In addition, ammonia is relatively cheap and abundant, making it an, an attractive alternative to, sorry, to other refrigerants, such as hydrofluorocarbons. Um, A study by Fagan et al. 2017 investigated the economic benefits of using ammonia in refrigeration in refrigeration system and found that ammonia based refrigeration system can provide significant cost saving comparable to HFC based system. In conclusion, um, using Michael Friday's discovery of ammonia in small to medium sized fishing vessels it so is something worth experimenting as the benefits of such outweighs the possible risk that may rise if such sophisticated equipment is not adhered to and maintained. Furthermore, this experiment will contribute to health, ecosystem, and marine life as fishermen will be able to store their fishes longer for the journey and ahead of the use of embalming fluid. Thank you. Okay. Good afternoon, everyone. I am Darren Coleman, and my research is the use of waste, use of waste plastic as an aggregate. Globally, plastic production has doubled since the start of the century to almost 400 million metric tons per year. The lifespan of a plastic is average about 10 years. Plastic can take up to 500 years to decompose. Only 9% of plastic is recycled, 12% incinerated, and 79% end up in landfill or the environment. This is the danger that we are facing with plastic, waste plastic. The purpose of this study is to incorporate PET and HDPE recycled plastic into concrete mixtures in an innovative, economical, and friendly way. The research seeks to explore the possibility of not only integrating the plastic with concrete mixture, but extend the to possibility of recycling plastic to construction marl in the process of developing road networks. Polyethylene is one of the most common thermoplastic resin of polyester used in various types of pro of products, mainly in packaging. The recycling consists of the transformation of bottles through two different processes, mechanical and chemical. Mechanical process. Most employ physical process to recycle. That is basically um, using bottles and so forth to recycle, do other things, making things work around the home and so, so on and so forth. The other way is consists of three Stages that include separation, washing, and grinding. And also, flake produce can be directly employed without the need of being reprocessed as pellet or, created, or creation, of production in, creation of production by injection or extrusion. 
The other way is the chemical process. Consists of separation of the basic components or monomers. This research seeks to incorporate a selective type of plastic, PE, PET and HDPE plastic, to incorporate in concrete mixture. Additives seek as to add to a ratio and thus reducing the portion of the other aggregates without reducing the strength. In Jamaica, the building code specif specifies that all black pocket cavities are to be filled with concrete to give the structure additional strength. The purpose of this research is to use the new concrete mixture to fill black pockets. The new concrete, plas the new concrete plastic mixture is more economical, lighter, provide good insulation and shock absorption. One. Okay. All right. Um, this is a design methodology. Um, I'm just going to give you a few steps in how this plastic will be used in concrete mixture. First of all, we need to separate the plastic, separate the recycled plastic aggregate. Test on, on cement, specific gravity, so on and so forth. The aggregate will be tested. Selection of aggregate are based on the standard and codes. The use of a concrete mixture and a concrete vibrator is produce a proper mix and remove air pockets from the mixture. Specimen tested the new bond, concrete, the compressive and split tensile strength. And then the, 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 the specimen will be cured and then the, the, the result will be communicated. Okay. Last but not least. The recycled bottle can be used in concrete production in certain replacement rate. This approach reduces the self-weight of concrete in structure and help conserve natural resources such as sand. Although the mechanical property of concrete decreases by increasing the replacement ratio of PET and plastic at negative effect on fire resistant concrete, plastic particles can encapsulate from other material and produce, envir to pro and produce environmentally safe concrete. In addition, Recycled plastic bottle can be used in many applications such as highway medians, sub bases and highway pavement, casting of floors, filling block pockets and various structure where strength is not an important factor. This is my research. Thank you very much. Okay. Good afternoon, everyone. My name, is, my name is Tyler Guy, and today I'll be speaking with you all about the selected sports ball pressure monitoring system. So football, American football, which is the NFL, and basketball are three of the most beloved sports in today's age, and it amasses roughly a fan base of 3.5 billion fans around the world. So basically, my design is about trying to expedite the process of monitoring ear pressure in sports balls. So OK. So basically, the objective, as I said before, is to ensure that the, there is a consistent, consistent ear pressure maintained within these sports balls, and that our proposed device that I'm presenting to you is able to measure ear pressure correctly within balls, replacing current subjective methods of assessment and giving more precise readings. So 
the methodology of how we would go about this. I believe that having a capacitive pressure sensor, a sorbethane material, and uh, a wireless watch. So the capacitive pressure sensor, it is very reliable and also precise in regarding ear pressure. So it is being considered and also had opted to consider the TPMS, but depending on size, had opted to use the capacitive instead. Because the research basically with the capacitive, it involves the integration of capacitive centers, sensors within the sports ball to detect variations in ear pressure and the sorbethane material, it's basically used to safeguard that, that sensor to prevent any irregularities during gameplay. And with the smartwatch display, it would be implied to receive and display the data transmitted wirelessly through radio waves from the capacitive sensor. So basically what it would do is to give off electrical signals and uh, then the electrical signals would be transferred to the, to the wireless watch and from it officials could therefore deduce if there are any irregularities in the ball. So basically the concept of our um, pressure monitoring system would be similar to that of um, a virtual assistance referee, the VAR system where referees would check the screen to see if there are any foul play or irregularities. So the expected results from this is really to, you know, to prevent any false or, or any false play within, with, um, upon the field, to ensure that there are no irregularities within the ball, to ensure that there's no cheating, the maintain air pressure is, is maintained. And uh, To conclude this, I believe that this development would really maximize how we look at sports going forward because there were cases, I believe, in the NFL, a famous player such as Tom Brady where they had claimed that there was some false play within a Super Bowl match that they claimed that he had cheated because he either deflated the ball or something to that. And I believe that the implementation of this system is to mitigate all foul play and anything that could interfere with the game that we love. Thank you. All right, so um, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Leonard Smith, and um, my presentation will be on a water bottle that has a built-in pH level sensor and an ionization unit. Um, this research was done by myself, um, a group member, Rashid Gordon and Adrian Cunningham. And so basically, I'd start off with this statistic from the WHO. Um, the WHO warns that Micro, my, microbiologically contaminated drinking water can transmit diseases like diarrhea, cholera, dysentery, typhoid, and polio, which are known to cause 485,000 deaths annually. And many of these deaths are due to people who simply did not know the, something as simple as the pH level of their water bottle, their, the water that they were drinking. So really and truly what our water bottle was designed, it was designed to help to reduce some of the deaths um, that are caused by persons consuming um, contaminated, contaminated water. So the water bottle contains an, a pH level sensor that tells of the pH level of the water 
and it contains an ionization unit that will help to improve the quality of the water in the case that it is too acidic. So just to give you a quick um, understanding of the pH value, the pH scale ranges from 0 to 14, with 7 being in the middle neutral, and anything below 7 is considered acidic, and anything above 7 is alkaline. So when, whenever you have a water source that is too acidic, this represents that there is some amount of unwanted contaminants like fecal matter and some other um, contaminants that you wouldn't want to consume. So with the help of this water bottle, what it really aims to do is by showing this person, um, letting them know the pH level of their water, just this simple um, um, amount, uh, the bottle would display a red light if it's acidic, um, a green light if the pH level is at an acceptable range of around 6.5 to roughly 7.5 or if it is close to being acidic, which is maybe around 4 to around 5.5 .5 on the pH scale. Um, how, how, the, the operate, how the bottle, bottle would operate is that um, the pH sensor is built into the cap of the water bottle. So whenever, as soon as you throw, throw in some water in the bottle and screw on the cap, immediately the water will make contact with the sensor and this um, get the pH value and display the light, the correct light, according to the level. So the person can decide to make use of the ionization unit to improve the quality of the water, improve, increase the pH, making it more drinkable, or simply decide to find, get water from another source. Because just knowing that your water might have some unwanted contaminants is enough to save someone from um, something like that. So as I said, the expected results is to help to reduce the number of deaths from persons consuming this dirty water. And it will help to increase um, the oxygen blood take in, in the bloodstream as well. This is beneficial, is shown to be beneficial to athletes as well. Um, when they're exercising and to rehydrate themselves. All right, and in, yes, that's concluding my presentation. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Gabriel Scott. And this is a research that I did when I was in my third year. And this is, is a, this is a very personal research because you might be wondering, why am I doing a research that is based on the biomedical side? Because I'm not a bio, my, biomedical engineer, but this came from a personal you know, experience. And I decided I want to do further research on sickle cell amina because I myself is a sickle cell patient and I've seen where sickle cell is not given that you know, much attention as it should. And so I decided that I wanted to do my research on this particular sickness or illness. So what is sickle cell? It is basically a blood, blood dis disorder, disorder where the blood cells are sickle shape or crescent shape, or it has a moon shape. And what this disease does is it affects the joints, cause severe pain, swelling the hands, and it also reduce our lifespan as well. And so what I realize is that a lot of time when people enter into marriage and childbirth, they do not know that they are a carrier of the genes. And that is, that is why so many babies are being born every year with this disease, because parents are, are, are unaware that they are you know, carriers of the gene, because people who are sickle cell trait does not show any signs or symptoms that they are a carrier of the gene. And so I have came up with the idea to design a digital home test kit monitor for a sickle cell amenia patient. And what this device is basically do is allow people to test at home to, to make sure that they are not a carrier of the genes in order to prevent the amount of babies that are being birthed every year with the severity of the disease. Because trust me, if you have a 
I, I know people in here can attest to it who have uh, family members who are, you know, a, a victim of this disease. You, you can attest that this disease causes a lot of pain, it causes a lot of money, and it can be very, very devastating. And as such, I've decided that I want to create a digital home test kit to test for the disease uh, in the early stage in the parents to ensure that they are not care of the genes. And what this uh, device will basically do is basically a testing strip like any other you know, testing method will be inserted into the, into the device. A blood sample will be added to the testing strip which has a buffer solution that mixes with the blood. And what this does, electrical current, electrical field will be created within the monitor and electrical current will be used to separate the abnormal hemoglobins from the, uh, from the normal hemoglobins. And this device will be able to tell you if you are positive, if you are negative for the, for, for the genes of sickle cell, not only just the genes of a sickle cell, but what type of genes that you're carrying, as well as to tell the patient what's the blood code. And I see this device very, very vital because in countries like Saudi Arabia and parts of Africa where there is no resources at all to test for this, for this disease, you will find that there are lots, a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot of people, lots of babies are being born with, the, born with the disease in places like Saudi Arabia and other parts of Africa where there is no, absolute no resources to test for the disease. Also, this is a program that I had written. I'm not sure if you can see it clearly. Um, it's basically show you how the monitor will operate, how the program will run. Um, basically, when a blood sample is added into, mach into the machine, what the results of the machines, mach what the machine results will, will look like as well. And I'll turn over to my other colleagues who had helped me with these results. All right, so here you can see some of the expected results in terms of our device compared to other devices. Our devices will take approximately two minutes from the moment you turn it on, put in the blood sample on the strip, insert it into the machine. In terms of it's giving in your results, it'll take two minutes. Um, some of the limitations we have is that the patient conditions, whether the patient is on certain medications, and those other factors can impact the results of this machine. So in conclusion, this device would be very useful to the world as it will help prevent a lot of births for babies with carrying the sickle cell disease traits. Thank you. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is John Mark Codner. Beside me, you have Trey Codner, my other colleague, and we had Lucian Smith, who were the researchers of this topic. Our topic consists of a supercooler system that will efficiently um, minimize the amount of wastage water in the thermal power pond system. For example, JPS, the Jamaica Public Service, what that will allow is that the water being wasted into the environment with, via steam throughout the system will be captured and using a heat exchange element where you have liquefied natural gas being implemented to act as the fuel for the thermal power point, it will actually use a heat exchange so the liquefied natural gas will be heated and the steam will be cooled, converting it back into water and reintroduced into the system where you would have uh, the water being saved, the wasted water in the system. So just a little background on that, the Jamaica Public Service, JPS, actually has a little problem where they're losing an amount of water over given hours because it's been lost in high pressurized steam, high saturated steam where it's been lost into the environment and what we have created is a super cooler system that actually converts that steam back into water and then saves it so it can be reintroduced into the system other than getting excess water from somewhere else to be reintroduced into the system. You can skip it to the next one. And that's the methodology there where we're talking about the heat exchange. So we'll have the steam being in one pipe. You have a larger pipe, the steam being introduced into the pipe, and the natural gas will be around that pipe. And you have an heat exchange where you have as much the maximum heat exchange as possible needed. So you have the water being 
the steam being converted into water, the natural gas being converted, natural liquefied natural gas being converted into gas so it can be used to actually power the power plant. Okay, so um, the way our system works is based off of currently existing condensing systems or condensing units where they have the steam being pumped through the main entrance. It's circulated where water is pumped from a separate location, um, normally at room temperature and that or um, atmospheric temperature that is, is pumped through smaller um, tubes and that tube cools down the steam and uh, that steam is converted back to water and may be reintroduced into the system. However, what our, where ours differentiate is that it uses liquid natural gas, this is LNG, because that is the power source and currently liquid, um, to store liquid natural gas, you need it to be at negative 160 degrees Celsius, which is very low. Super saturated steam or superheated steam is, at one, is greater than 100 um, degrees Celsius. So that heat exchange that happens in our condensing tube will turn um, the steam back to its liquid state to water and reheat the liquid natural gas to a usable form in the form of a in its gaseous form to be pumped back into the system into the fuel cellage and used to boil water to basically continue the cycle. Now limitations of our system include the fact that we as students do not have easy access to liquid natural um, to LNG or to a condensing unit or to um, any of that stuff. So what we had to do was simulate it, do our designs, try and get our calculations based off of the condensing, um, the various heat properties associated with LNG, um, most particularly methane, because that's the most abundant gas um, in LNG, and water and see what the length of the tube would have to be, how many of the smaller tubes we would need and basically how the heat transfer would work to make it as optimal as possible. Um, however, since all of this was done in simulations and mathematical equations, we can't really say for certain that this is the most efficient way to go. However, it is certainly more efficient than the current method of just having a large body of water pumping through the system and uh, that being wasted. Also recovers some of the steam to pump back into the system to keep as little waste as possible. In conclusion, our system is basically going to be more efficient. It's going to reduce waste. And what we hope to accomplish is to, um, what we hope to accomplish is to add this to different systems, see how we can make it more efficient, see how we can um, calculate better using actual physical um, yeah, based using actual physical models. Thank you. Limb loss significantly reduces the quality of life of amputees. Sorry. Uh, and uh, my apologies. So limb loss significantly reduces the quality of life of amputees. And one of the greatest complaints from amputees about prosthetics is that it's not fully functional. So my group members and I, Akela Bailey, Rural Stewart, Alex Sebastian, and myself, Cheyenne Darby, decided that we wanted to increase the dynamic range of the flexible, of the flexible electrostatic transducer in order to improve sensory haptic in prosthetic limbs. Now, this research aims to improve haptic feedback for upper limb prosthetics by enhancing the electrostatic transducer. How did we do this, you may ask? So what we did, we implemented the material mylar. What's going on here? We used the material mylar due to its mechanical properties to create the diaphragm of the 
electrostatic transducer. This is to increase the sensitivity of this transducer. As well as we utilize the interdigitated fringing free electrodes, which would allow for better sensitivity of the transducer. Now the dynamic range has to do with the limits of stimuli that the transducer can detect. So currently, the transducer can detect to about 40 to 60 decibels, which is quite a very limited range. So we decided that we wanted to increase this to 40 decibels to about 90 decibels. Now, how does this work? Sensors will be embedded in the synthetic skin of the prosthetic limbs, which will provide information to the transducer, and the transducer will translate this information into electrical impulses to the microprocessors. Microprocessor, my apologies. And the microprocessor now processes these signals and sends it to the actuator. The actuator reacts and provides tact tactile feedback to the user. So the user will, in layman words, touch. They will be able to react to touch and have, be able to feel life around them. Because, I mean, I'm, losing a limb is a, a life-changing experience. Now, the interdigitated um, electrodes, they... The interdigitated electrodes improve the quality of the transducer. Currently, they're using the curve electrodes. And the limitation with the curve electrode is that it does not provide that level of sensitivity that the transducer needs. So we have decided, based on research, that the fringing free aspect of the interdigitated electrode would be best for this research. In conclusion, in conclusion, we have decided we decided that the pursuit of increasing the dynam dynamic range of the flexible electrostatic transducer represents a pivotal step towards enhancing haptic sensory feedback and giving amputees the life they once lost. I leave with this quote: "Amputation is the tragic symphony of loss, but through engineering we orchestrate the future, composing a harmony of sensory feedback that refines what it means to feel complete." Thank you. Thank you very much. Please give the students a, a, a better honor. Um, they, they represent our replacement. <laughs> Applaud for that as well. <laughs> um, I want to thank um, those who stayed. I was told that there are no questions by Prof because of time. Um, yes, I, I was so advised. Um, I would just say that remember that these are our students and, and remember when you see them 10 years down the road that this is where you gave them the opportunity to have their ideas heard. Um, this morning when my good friend, Mr. McCarthy, presented, people wondered and questioned about, will robots take over the world? What will happen in the future that you're going to be paid for your ideas? Everything begins with your ideas. So I want to commend the students for their ideas to solve engineering problems. And I want to thank those who came with accent from overseas as well. Thank you all, and, and you did very well. Thank you, Prof. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Broomfield. Last year, after the conference, we, we had the contemplation that we're going to have a student segment this year. I think uh, this is going to be part of our feature going forward. And I think uh, next year conference, we let the student segment come in the first day so that they can capture uh, a large number of uh, our audience. Uh, I want to use this opportunity to introduce uh, one important person here who has been sponsoring this uh, conference since last year, Dr. Daniel Dawes, who is the CEO of Universal Service Fund. Please stand, sir. The same you appreciate you, sir. 
and I know next year I will be coming back to you, if I'm still alive. Seaboard Marine Tourism Enhancement Fund, and I want to recognize our partner from the Bahamas, LJM Maritime Academy. Thank you, Dr. Johnson, for being with you and with your contingent of uh, staff and uh, cadets. Our Vice Chancellor from Olusegun Agagu University of Science and Technology, all the way from Nigeria, uh, that is like about 28 hours of uh, flight from that end to this location here, Excelsior Community College. And I think I still see one of our colleagues here in the room, Jamaica Conference Center. And our presenters and the panels, please let me, help me put your hands together for them once more. And to you, our guests, I am happy to see many of you still stay with us uh, up to this time. It means that uh, we have an exciting conference and um, presentations, uh, 2023. I want to commend uh, the conference center for providing this location for us. Next year, we'll be coming back, and I believe we'll fill almost every chair here when we come back uh, next year. So, colleagues, uh, the media people, the marketing department, I must tell you, Archie, where is Archie and his team? Excellent work. Excellent work. And all that coming out of the Caribbean Maritime uh, University, the press, uh, the technical persons, we really appreciate you for staying with us uh, to this time. And I'm not going to leave my good friend out of this who travel all the way from Antigua to represent two organizations, Antigua and Barbuda Port Authority, as well as Port Management Association of the Caribbean. And somebody sitting right in front of me, Captain Bobs. We hope you will join us again next year. And uh, our theme next year, we have been contemplating it, is going to be on maritime and the blue economy. So, ladies and gentlemen, after this session, picture taking. So, I wish you all journey messages to your respective uh, homes. Those that are flying out tomorrow, Sunday, and next week, journey messages. Thank you very much.